Okay. Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Terrific. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm, I decided to do is to talk about ongoing work uh, as rather than going backwards and uh, giving you a historical uh, perspective. Uh, and in particular, our laboratory works on a series of different fields. Uh, we work on cancer, uh, particularly uh, childhood cancers. We work on uh, uh, development of a new technology. And recently, we've gone to working in uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, and so it, this is the work that I will describe next. Uh, <clears throat> The, I think you're all familiar with Hox genes. Uh, these are important for developing your uh, body plan. That is, there are a set of coordinates that tell you uh, anterior from posterior and, uh, and everything in between. And also all the minor axes, uh, for example, proximal and distal axes and so on. And our laboratory has been studying Hox genes for quite a long time. And different members have been responsible for inactivating one or more of those genes. There's 39 of them. And uh, Joy Greer, her uh, gene of interest was HOXB8. Uh, so she inactivated it and then uh, looked at the mouse and it looked fairly normal, which was sort of surprising because we, even in heterozygotes, you often see defects associated with uh, a, a bodily dysfunction in terms of making the body. Uh, so she did turn to just looking at the behavior. And so uh, since mice behave mostly at nighttime, she took uh, infrared cameras and then started just uh, taking movies and then classifying all the different activities of that mouse. And so here's, for example, an experiment where uh, the, uh, the, uh, these are sib pairs and they're matched also for sex. Uh, and then the black bar would be a mutant, a HOXB8 mutant homozygote, and the gray bar would be a, uh, a uh, <coughs> normal SIB uh, uh, pair. Okay, let will get rid of this thing. Uh, so what you can see is that uh, in terms of eating, uh, these mice were perfectly normal. Uh, and she looked at many, many different behaviors, anything she could think of, and then the only thing that seemed different was how much time they're spent grooming. And what you can see is that the mutant mice, Hoxb8 mutant mice, spend about twice as much time grooming as normal. We can also induce the grooming uh, by just spraying water on a mouse and then that induces it to start to groom. And in this case, we actually cross to wild type mice, but these are wild type mice in the field. And so what we wanted to see is whether genetic background made any difference, and the answer is no. So uh, <coughs> if you simply follow the, uh, the genotype, then you got the phenotype, that is over grooming. Uh, I told you one slight error. If over a 24-hour period you spend too much time doing one thing, then you have to take it away from something else. And so these mice spend more time grooming but less time sleeping. And this is simply showing you that grooming is a very stereotyped behavior. Uh, you go into the shower, you lather your hands, you start working at the top of your body and you work down the body. Uh, and this is true for all mammals. Uh, and in this case, uh, the last thing that they groom is their tail. And this behavior is very stereotypic. Uh, and what we see is the mutant mice have the exact same behavior. It's not affecting the quality of the behavior, but what it affects is how many grooming bouts and how long each grooming bout stays. I'll show you a film to show you that it is pathological. And so what you'll see is the mouse continues to groom and groom and groom. And if when it turns, what you can see is it starts removing body hair. There. 
and there it is. So it's removing the body hair, and it would continue to do that, and actually has lacerations. And so at this point, we have to put them to sleep. So that it is pathological. This is very similar to a human condition called OCD spectrum disorder, that is removal of all body hair. And it's quite common, it's about 3% of all people, uh, regardless of ge geography, have this particular condition. Now we switched, I mean, taking movies is a very time consuming because then you have to look frame by frame, what is this mouse doing? And so what we have are platforms that are extremely sensitive to vibration. And whatever you're doing, you give it a different output of vibration if it had involves motion. So you can distinguish walking from running, you can distinguish eating from drinking and so on. All of these uh, different behaviors give rise to different uh, vibration patterns. And then we have algorithm to tell us what is that particular uh, vibration pattern. Now this is sort of an, an, an unusual experiment. If we put a normal mouse in a cage with a mutant mouse, it also grooms it. But the pattern is opposite. That is, it's removing all the body hair on the dorsal side because that's what's exposed to it. And this is a normal mouse. And that told us something quite important. And that is, it's not likely to be an itch. It's not likely to feel an itch on another mouse. Okay. That is, it's going to be central nervous system. So then we looked into the brain to see whether OXB8 is expressed. And we couldn't find it. Uh, using a normal in situ hybridization techniques. So we decided, well, we'll simply use a reporter gene. That is, we can take a gene from a jellyfish, put it in the uh, decoding sequence of a, uh, another gene, and wherever that gene is expressed, those cells will turn green and then tell us where those, that particular gene is expressed. So we did that experiment, and we got a very unusual effect. That is, the only cells in the brain that were green were microglia. And microglia are essentially derived from the uh, bone, from the hemopoietic system, and then migrate into the brain, and then function as uh, <coughs> uh, essentially macrophages in the brain. So what I'm telling you is that microglia are controlling behavior. That is, the microglia are affecting neural circuits. Okay, and so here simply now using better technology, so they are microglia, they look like microglia, and they have markers of microglia, so we believe they are indeed microglia. And I was using two photon microscopy uh, in a live mouse. So microglia, as I just told you, are immune cells, and they're derived from hemopoiesis and function as macrophages. And now what we're pro proposing is that microglia are actually also controlling uh, neural circuits and giving rise, you know, when they're defective, to distinct behavioral outputs. So this made a very strong prediction that we should be able to cure the uh, pathological grooming by doing a bone marrow transplant. Because if they are hemopoietic, if there are stem cells derived from the hemopoietic system, then they should be able to essentially compensate for the bad cells if we do a bone marrow transplantation. So first of all, can we actually get microglia into the brain? So we simply used my, uh, <coughs> bone marrow that was uh, GFP labeled, and then uh, we injected into the brain uh, four weeks, we don't see very much, we see a few cells. Then by 12 weeks, which is about the normal course in a normal bone marrow transplant, we see many cells. We're getting about 75% uh, uptake of those. And we have to radiate. Uh, this is a lethally radiated mouse, so we have to, uh, it has to have the, bo uh, the bone marrow transplant has to work for the mouse to live. And then under those conditions, we're also destroying the blood-brain barrier, and therefore these cells can now get into the brain. So here's the actual experiment. Here is a mutant mouse. We're looking at about uh, three weeks after uh, 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 doing the transplantation. Remember, they're lethally irradiated. And at this point now, they start showing full-blown removal of body hair. 
If we then look at 12 weeks after bone marrow transplant into a, a mutant mouse using normal, bo uh, using, uh, normal bone marrow, then we get complete restoration uh, of the hair. All the uh, lacerations are cured, and this mouse is permanently cured of that behavior. And further, if we look at the mountain spent, uh, mount of time spent grooming, uh, you have first the wild type, then the mutant, which is about twice as much, and then now it's restored, restored back to normal. So both the removable, uh, removal of body hair as well as uh, being, uh, maintaining that behavior in terms of over-grooming has been cured, permanently cured by a bone marrow transplant. We can do the opposite. We can put uh, <coughs> nor mutant bone marrow into a normal mouse and give it the uh, phenotype. Therefore, it says it's both necessary and sufficient to have these defective microglia are then responsible for the behavior. So what we're suggesting is indeed that the microglia are causative for the behavioral deficit, and that it's very similar to human trichotillomania. So there was a problem. Hox genes do lots of things. Okay, and so not only, they usually have roughly maybe a thousand target genes, so they're doing many, many different things. And it was also known that HOXB8 caused nociceptive defects, that is, uh, insensitivity to pain. And so another group suggested maybe that was the cause of our results, and so we had to look into this uh, possibility. Now, here is the phenotype. I should, uh, first of all, if you look at the spinal cord, the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord, these are markers that uh, affect both the, uh, the <coughs> sensory cells going into the brain uh, and then also markers that are in the interneurons that receive those inputs. <coughs> what we see in the top line is the normal uh, mouse and at the bottom we see the mutant mouse. And so <coughs> what you can see is that, first of all, the nice lamellar structure of these <coughs> interneurons are disrupted and further, there are <coughs> many fewer cells. So that's the defect with respect to the insensitivity to pain. We can also do a behavioral assay, simply put them on a hot plate, and then ask how quickly do they respond. This isn't a really hot plate, but it's uncomfortable. And what a mouse does is then jump. And we measure the time it takes it to respond. And again, we see that the mutants take about uh, three times longer to respond than normal. Okay. So the first indication, essentially, that they actually the, we could separate these two phenotypes. So the question is, we know that HOXP8 is responsible for both of these, but are they separable, or are they actually the same phenomena, was actually in the rescue experiment itself. So here, remember that when we put in normal bone marrow into a mutant mouse, we completely cured the overgrooming and removal of, bio, of the removal of the body hair as well as the lacerations. So that was all cured. And what, what we can see here is that it didn't affect the insensitivity to pain uh, in this rescue experiment. So it's still now uh, insensitive to pain. So that indicated maybe we could separate these two phenomena. And the way you do that is simply to do conditional inactivation. That is, do the inactivation specifically, for example, in the bone marrow, and then ask what happens and then do it specifically in the nervous system, and particularly in the uh, <coughs> cells of the spinal cord, and then ask what happens. And so we use Tai 2 Cre as a marker for the hemopoietic system because it's expressed in hemopoietic stem cells. Okay. And so first of all, does it make green cells? And the answer is yes, that's good. And then what happens in the actual experiment? So here is a mouse. We're essentially we're just inactivating it into the hemopoietic system. Uh, you can see it's removed the body hair. It's spending more time grooming, but it has not affected insensitivity to pain. So well, that allows us to look at it in that direction. Okay? We can also look at the phenotype with respect to the spinal cord. And here we're looking at the mutant, inactivating it. And then what we see essentially is that it does not affect the spinal cord pattern. 
if you express, look at your right versus the very left, it's the same pattern, it's not the mutant pattern. So now we can do the opposite. Let's inactivate it in the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord and see what happens, specifically just HOXB8 in the spinal cord. Okay? And for that, we used HOXC8, a parallel of HOXB8 that is uh, not expressed in the microglia, but has the exact same expression pattern in the spinal cord. And, and here we do the experiment. We inactivate <coughs> uh, uh, Hox B8 with Hox C8 uh, Cree driver, and then we look at the mouse and see that nobody here is removed. We do not affect their mouse spent grooming, but we recapitulate the insensitivity of pain. Okay, so that's the opposite end now. So we can separate those two phenotypes. So they're both Hox B8 is responsible for the two, but there isn't the overlap with respect to those phenotypes. Okay, and again, if we look at the spinal cord. Now we see the mutant pattern as opposed to the uh, uh, regular pattern, that is middle versus your right side. Okay. So the next question was, in the literature, there's only one source of microglia. All of the microglia is thought to come from the yolk sac, where hemopoiesis starts, and then directly go to the brain at E9.5 and a half the gestation, uh, and then, uh, <clears throat> then the blood barrier closes, and that's all the microglia that that uh, mouse ever sees, and all the cells, all the microglia are capable of self-renewal, and therefore are maintained by a, a constant re replication as well as uh, cell death. So, and a uh, very pretty paper uh, shows this, that uh, indeed if you use cell lineage in analysis, uh, they said that the, all the microglia come from the <coughs> yolk sac. Unfortunately, the, uh, the technology allowed them only to see about 30% uh, about of total cells. They couldn't label all cells. So that left the window open that there might be other populations of microglia. So this is the model that uh, they proposed. Essentially, here's microglia. They're made in the uh, <coughs> yolk sac and then migrate into the brain, and then at about 9.5, they start getting into the, the neural system, and then the system closes, the blood barrier closes, and then there's no more exchange after that. So in order to address this idea, we decided to make mice that had two colors uh, of microglia. They had green ones that labeled all microglia. This is a, a marker for all microglia, and then there's a GFP insertion, so wherever the microglia are expressed, then they will turn green. And then we used our Cree lock system to label uh, red, our microglia, HOXB8 microglia, red. And what you can see, there's, there are two populations, red ones and green ones. The green ones, solely green, are the, what we would call the canonical microglia. And then the ones that show both colors with our HOXB8 microglia. So we can just, again, this is live imaging in a uh, mouse using two photon microscopy. Okay, so the first thing we looked is to simply ask when do our yellow microglia, that is, they contain both TD tomato as well as GFP, when do they arrive in the brain? And, and what we can see is up to uh, E10.5. Uh, and earlier, we never see any yellow cells in the brain. And then at E12.5, we just start beginning to see some yellow cells. And then that builds up, and then there's a steady state uh, from uh, essentially P8 onward. And about 25 to 30% of the cells are HOXB8 microglia, and the rest are non-HOXB8 microglia. Now, this could be accounted for by two hypotheses. One is that the green cells turn on HOXB8 in the brain, uh, starting at E12.5, and then become yellow cells. So it's a cell population that turns on HOXB8. Or alternatively, it's, it's a new population that gets into the brain later uh, that is specific for Hox, expressing HOXB8. Okay, so we looked at when is HOXB8 expressed. Remember what I was showing you in terms of color is cell lineage. It's not when the genes express, but simply once you turn on the marker, then it stays on forever and marks that cell 
indefinitely. So it doesn't tell you when the genes express, it simply tells you that that cell did express HOXP8. But if we use quantitative RT-PCR, what we see is it's primarily expressed in the yolk sac. And it's expressed in the yolk sac, there's actually two phases of yolk sac hemopoiesis. There's an early phase and a second phase. And this, in HOXP8 canonical microglia, the green ones, are expressed very early, seven and a half days of gestation, and then it, it stops. Whereas in HOXP8, what we see is the expression starting at around 8.5 8 days of gestation, uh, which you may say is well, just one day later, but that's actually 19 days of the total gestation period for a mouse. So it's a, a significant fraction of its time, lifetime. And we can see a little expression in AGM, and we never see any expression in fetal liver, and undetectable, meaning much less than one transcript per cell uh, in the brain ever. Okay? So this does not support the first hypothesis that a subpopulation of microglia in the brain, the green ones, turned on HOXP8 uh, and therefore su suggests that it's a new population that's coming in later. Okay. So this simply uh, says that <coughs> hemopoiesis is complex, it uh, travels from one organ to the next and so on. And so we have to look through all of those and see when does our population show up? And if you look in the yolk sac, what we can see is about 3% of hemopoietic, stem, of hemopoietic progenitor cells are, <coughs> are uh, HOXP8 labeled. Then you look in the AGM, you have an enormous amplification, about 16-fold in terms of numbers. And then if you look in the fetal liver, then there's about 280-fold uh, exp uh, expansion of this population relative to yolk sac. So which would be equivalent, first of all, into about a four-fold uh, replication and then a 16-fold uh, replication later on. If we look at actually just the timing of when uh, do we see uh, HOXB8 microglia, that means HOX HOXB8 progenitor cells in the different compartments, we see uh, less than 3% in the yolk sac, and then there's a big rise in the, uh, in the AGM, and then uh, an equivalent large rise in almost 100% of the labels are progenitor cells in the uh, bone marrow. Uh, and fetal liver are expressing this marker. So there, as, as I pointed out, there are two waves of hemopoiesis, and right now there's still quite a bit of controversy as to what's happening in terms of progenitor cells during those waves. There are two camps, essentially. Uh, one is an English group, which supports um, many different progenitor cells, populations being made uh, in the yolk sac. And the other says that there is a predominant population, and that is actually fetal hemopoietic stem cells. And so, and that's supported here in one lab and then the other labs. So we looked essentially, the marker that they're using is SCA1 as a marker for progenitor cells. So we looked also at SCA1, and we can see now that there is a expression of SCA1 in terms of also being uh, red, that is you know, expressing HOXB8 at one time, and then well, we see um, um, numbers increasing also in the, uh, in the AGM, and then finally in the fetal liver, and if we continue all of these studies, then it finally goes up to about 100% in the fetal liver. We can also look in the, uh, <coughs> in the bone marrow itself, is HOXB8 expressed in hemopoietic stem cells, and the answer is yes. Nearly 100% of the hemopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow are labeled with HOXP8, but the gene isn't expressed. Okay, so that means that the expression of this gene had to have occurred much earlier than in the yolk sac. So from this, <coughs> we uh, support a second model where it says <coughs> the canonical microglia do come from the yolk sac and then directly go into the brain. And then there's a second population that starts at around E12.5 that goes uh, first <coughs> from the yolk sac to the AGM, gets amplified, and then goes to the fetal liver, gets amplified, and finally ends up in the brain. So we're supporting that second hypothesis. 
So uh, now I'm going to simply show you that <coughs> these two, the reason uh, I'm going into this great detail is that the hemopoietic stem cell field is fairly conservative. And, uh, uh, and so we have to go very carefully and document all of the different new ways, essentially the ontology of these cells and show that they are indeed different. And are there similarities and dissimilarities <coughs> between these two populations? And the first thing you can do is simply look at gene expression. So we've looked at the gene expression of green ones and red ones because we can separate them by cell sorting. And they're remarkably similar. There are about 21 genes, essentially, that are different. Considering that there are you know, maybe, I don't know, 100,000 gene products, uh, maybe 25,000 different genes, uh, this is very, very similar. So they look like microglia in terms of transcription, and those 21 genes are quite interesting, and we're following them up. Okay. There are two markers that now are accepted as being markers of microglia. One is called the TMEM119, another is called SAL1. So we asked, well, do, do our genes, does HOXB8 microglia also express these two markers? And the answer is yes. <coughs> and they're expressed exactly at the same fold. And we can also do by in situ hybridization, we can ask how many of the red cells actually express TMEM9, and it's greater than 98%. So that says that most of the of red cells that we're looking at are indeed a HOXB8 microglia. Okay. Now, having shown that they express the markers of a purified mi parenchymal microglia, mature microglia, then we can use this experiment to then, uh, this knowledge to do an experiment simply to do transplantation. That is, can we take our progenitor cells, inject them into the brain, and then do they turn into bona fide microglia? Okay, so the experiment is to take the progenitor pool to see get high D to the a positive pool uh, in fetal liver at E12.5, isolate those cells, purify them, isolate them, and then re-inject them into P1 uh, C57 black 6 mice, which have no labeled microglia at all. And then we can look for red cells in the brain. And here's the experiment. We also used the pan neuronal uh, microglial marker, the GFP marker, and then DD tomato, which specifically label HOXB8 microglia. And then we used TMEM, and what you can see is, uh, indeed, all those cells express all three markers. And as you expect, in the TMEM, there are also resident microglia that do not express, uh, will express TMEM, but do not express either DD tomato or GFP. But the coincidence is always all of the cells that are green are also red. Okay. So then what would that says? And since this has a mature marker for microglia, that the progenitor cells are indeed capable of making these cells uh, in vivo and once put into the brain environment. So now we looked at the behavior of these cells. So one of the things that microglia do is simply, if there's damage, they send their processes, this is a very quick response, in 25 minutes, they send their processes to the site of, uh, of um, damage and then start gobbling up those cells and the, and that debris and cleaning up the, the mess in the brain. So what we've used is a laser, this is in vivo imaging, we use a laser and that'll be directed right at the middle of the target, we'll kill a few neurons uh, you can't see the neurons because we're only labeling the microglia. And what you can see is both yellow ones and red ones. I don't know if you can distinguish that. Yes, okay. So the yellow ones are the HOXB8 microglia. The damage will be in the middle. And then both uh, red ones and green ones will send the processes to that damage. If the movie works. Whoops, come back. computer wants to do its own thing. So there's the damage right in the middle. Now you can see the processes, both the yellow ones and the green ones, arrive at exactly the same time. Okay. 
the reason we have to do these kind of experiments is that we can't stick, for example, a needle into the brain because all the microglia would go to the needle, okay, because there's damage there. So we have to do things from uh, using a laser, we can uh, focus in a very specific spot in the brain and then look to see what happens. So by this assay, these two microglia population are indeed doing the same thing. We can do another experiment where what we can do is cut the facial nerve and cut the facial nerve on one side and the facial, uh, the nuclei for the facial nerve are in the hindbrain and then we can look at one side where we've cut and then the other side is the control and then we can ask yellow and green cells how many are there there. And this assay takes about two weeks because what happens is the microglia change their morphology, become a little amoeboid and then travel to the site of damage and then start cleaning up uh, the debris. Okay. And what you can see is, maybe you can't see, but I can see, uh, that there are, A, there are many more microglia to, on the damage side, on your uh, right side, than there are on the control side of the same mouse. And that there, are, if we count yellow and green ones, what we find is that there are actually more, slightly more yellow ones than there are green ones. So in this particular assay, uh, the green ones are actually a little better. Uh, I mean, the red ones are a little better than the green ones. The fine, and the final role is of microglia is to do what's called synaptic pruning. That is, in your brain, you all, uh, as a rule, you always make about 20, twice as many connections as you need, and then the strong connections are maintained, and then there's a system, essentially, to weed out the weaker connections, and thereby reinforces the strong ones. Okay, and this is called synaptic pruning, and microglia are heavily involved in this process. And one can do this e most easily in the eye where you can put, inject a dye, which then uh, goes back to the uh, thalamus and where these connections are made. And then you can, uh, if you label that dye, and then we can look at red and green ones and how effective are they in synaptic pruning. And then what we see is if we do quantitative, we can show actually that the debris is inside the cell by rotating the cell and we can see that the yellow ones and green ones are equally effective in NASA assay. So again, both populations are behaving like microglia with respect to synaptic pruning. How do they differ? And they differ in where they are. The distribution in the brain is not the same for the two populations. And what we're looking here is, you see lots of red color on the, uh, on the posterior side of the brain, the cerebellum. So the anterior is at uh, your left, and uh, the cerebellum is at your right. And you see lots of input red, uh, and these are all the p of, uh, connections coming essentially from the spinal cord. So that red is ignored. But if you look very carefully at the microglial populations that spread all over, the, what you see is the regions that are high, levels of HOXB8 rel relative to non-HOXB8, and other th regions that are low. And for example, <coughs> Uh, the uh, primary and secondary motor cortex is high, the anterior aspect of the striatum is high, and the, uh, <coughs> and the uh, orbital cort lord uh, lateral orbital cortex is high with respect to HOXB8. Why is this interesting? Is because that's actually what's called the OCD circuit. And this has been found in humans, simply people with OCD and trichotillomania. There are certain areas where there, uh, those cells are overactive, in the patients, if they react to drugs, that uh, population goes down compared to controls. So that's been defined in humans as the OCD circuit, and fortuitously, HOXB8 are in the region responsible uh, for modulating that circuit. So what are we really looking at? I don't believe that this whole system was set up for simply looking at trichotillomania. That doesn't quite make sense to me. It would be a very elaborate for a very particular behavior. And so something that we may be looking at in addition to possibility is anxiety. So well, the first thing we looked at is are our mice anxious? And there are three common assays for anxiety. One is what's called an elevated maze. You put a mouse, a normal mouse, on an elevated maze, and uh, one arm has walls and the other doesn't. And a normal mouse will explore both uh, platforms. It will go from one to the other equally. 
Whereas an anxious mouse will stay on the one that has walls. It feels secure in that position. If it looks over the edge on the other ones, it gets queasy and therefore it's uncomfortable. And what you can see is a HoxP8 microglia, I mean HoxP8 mutant mice are very anxious with respect to this assay. They're staying always in the enclosed uh, arm. There's another assay which is so quite similar, which is actually simply put mice in an open field and, <clears throat> and then simply let it wander and we keep track of where they're wandering with a camera. And then what you can see is that an anxious mouse would stay on the periphery. They're comfortable because they have whiskers, they use the whiskers to guide them and they're secure when they can feel a wall and they don't go out into the middle. And again, by this assay, uh, <clears throat> they are very anxious. And then finally, there's a very simple assay where you can simply uh, provide two boxes. One is an open box and the other one's, I'm sorry, a lighted box and the other is a dark box. And a normal mouse will explore both, whereas a uh, mutant mouse will stay in the dark one, okay, and not go into the light one. And again, by that assay, again, these are very anxious mice. So the f one first thing we can ask is, well, if we give them drugs that are, affect anxiety, like floxetine, will that reduce their uh, grooming behavior? And the answer is that yes. These are drugs are commonly used in humans, so they're sensitive to those drugs. We can also ask, <coughs> does it affect their behavior? And the answer is yes. You now can restore in terms of the maze. It'll stay now spend an equal amount of time on both uh, arms, open and closed arms. And finally, in the Lark Dark test again, what you can see is you can restore essentially its ability to go into the light box. So here we are, we have microglia, and here we have the OCD circuit and trichotillomania circuit. And the question is, how do microglia control this behavior? And there are many possibilities. A microglia produce cytokines, they produce even neurotransmitters like glutamate. So they could affect that behavior through those kind of molecular ways. But there's a more interesting possibility, and that is Wacky et al. has shown that uh, in case of uh, microglia, if you uh, look at, for example, uh, the activity in the eye, uh, what you see is that they react to reactivity. That is, uh, <coughs> What the, normally a microglia wave their arms in space and keep going back and forth and back and forth, sensing the entire space. And then uh, all of a sudden they stop, and when they stop, what they do is actually, uh, the, all the projections go right around the synapse. So the question is, why are they doing that? That's a lot of effort and a lot of energy to do that. And could they be modulating that activity across that synapse by enclosing it? with membranes. And so I think now we have many possibilities as to how microglia could possibly be modulating particular neural circuits. And I'll stop for questions, or I'll actually just stop, I guess. We're not going to have questions. Thank you.